Good evening, everyone. My name is Misty Trunnell, and I'm the librarian for, for the Sojourner Truth African American Research Room located at the Oxford Hill Library. I'm excited that we're able to host this evening's author talk for you all. Today, we're going to have an author talk with author Jenny Mazur. Ms. Mazur is a native Washingtonian and the author of Heroes of the Underground Railroad Around Washington, D.C. Ms. Mazur has a doctorate degree in anthropology and worked as the National Capital Regional Manager for the National Under Underground Railroad Network to Freedom for the National Park Service. She held that position for 17 years. The book was published in 2019 and for the past year, Ms. Mazur has been trapped touring around the area, conducting interviews, book talks, author talks about the, re about the research contained in the book. Heroes of an Underground Railroad Around Washington, D.C. is a befitting and perfect match for the objectives of the Sojourner Truth Research Room. The objectives are to present, collect material and present research related to the African-American experience in Prince George's County. So this is a perfect match. Um, this evening talk, in this evening's talk, we'll focus on numerous acts of courageousness carried out by unknown figures of the Underground Railroad and their acts on taking freedom into their own hands and those who assisted them. And all of this happened in and around Prince George's County. So again, I want to say welcome to you all and thank you, Ms. Mazur, Mazur, for taking the time to reschedule this event and have this author talk with us. And to start off, I would like to ask you to give us some background about the development of the book and what led to you writing the book. Well, I when I was working for the National Park Service, I did a lot of networking with people who were doing research, local historians all across the region, and they all had stories they'd been working on that that were not known outside of the area that they were living in. And I thought the greater Washington area should be able to appreciate these stories, aside from people in other parts of the United States. And I wanted to do a book while I was working for the Park Service, but I didn't get to it. And I had an opportunity after I left, I retired, uh, with History Press to do a book, and I said to them that everybody in Black History Month hears about Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass, and I did not want to talk about them because I think that they're well known. I wanted to talk about some of these other people that are lesser known but deserve to be known. And so I was going to call the book The Unsung Heroes of the Underground Railroad Around Washington but the publisher preferred the title that it has. And uh, she wanted, the editor wanted there to be Washington in the title, so it's a little bit awkward. And if you look at the cover, can they see the cover? Uh, no, it's not yet. He's um, loading it for us. Oh, okay. Uh, it was, if you saw the cover on the announcement, there are two pictures on it. One of them is Anne Maria Weems from Montgomery County, a, a young teenager dressed as a boy. And the other is somebody from Leesburg who was working out of Washington, D.C. as an Underground Railroad conductor. His name was Leonard Grimes. He was born in Leesburg. We don't know whether he's born into slavery or born free. And then on the back, we have the British symbol of the uh, black man kneeling, begging for help, which uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit. And then we have a picture that you're going to see again of a group of enslaved people who are chained together who are going to be walking south to be sold in the cotton area. So that's the cover. 
and I went I wanted to make sure that the people who did the research approved of my using their research. So I, I talked to them all and, and most of them were thrilled. There are a couple stories. One of them, uh, a descendant was looking into the oral history from her grandmother. And at some point she said, I wanna look into this and see if I can find out more about it. And later she said 90% of what my grandmother said at least 90% was correct. I was able to document it. And so people don't always accept oral history as a good source, but I think that speaks for the for oral history. And I picked out some people from DC, uh, the Plummer family from Prince George's County, a couple stories from Montgomery County and Maria Weems, uh, uh, two people who are involved in a shootout at the Maryland Silver Spring uh, DC line, and then some people from Leesburg and um, a couple from Fairfax who ended up in Nantucket. And so what I wanted to start out talking about Maryland, and that's why the first slide shows a map of Maryland and the Chesapeake Bay. You can see the Mason-Dixon line, so I'm sure you all know this, but I just wanted to remind you that Maryland is in the Upper South. It's right on the border with Pennsylvania Delaware and very close to New Jersey and New York. And that all was very important. And if you look where Delaware is, you'll see that the Eastern shore was very close. Delaware was also a slave say, but from Delaware, it was a pretty short run to Pennsylvania or New Jersey. And Maryland was a slave state, of course, but it stayed a slave state until 1864 because it was a loyal state during the Civil War and sometimes people forget that. So that in the DC area, DC, Virginia and Maryland all got emancipation at different times. And Maryland did not get it until the state constitution was changed toward the end of the Civil War. And the time that's celebrated in Maryland is November for the emancipation. You probably all know that. Maryland being the Upper South, you know that you see the, the Chesapeake Bay, you can see the Potomac River, and you can see how close it is you can't see the mountains in Pennsylvania and the mountains over in Western Maryland, but there are mountains and they all kind of funnel you up to the north. So Maryland was in a special position and Maryland had been a tobacco state. It, that had been the cash crop for a long time, but by the time we're talking about in the 19th century before the Civil War, tobacco had exhausted the soil and the crops were changing over to grain and livestock. And that's a very important point to make because that meant that there was more labor than the slave owners could use. And that's why the next slide is, again, the coffle. Oh, I'm sorry, the definition of Underground Railroad, but the coffle comes after that. We'll get to that again. Um, so let me keep talking about uh, Maryland. Maryland, um, the Ma Prince George's County was closely tied to Virginia and um, to Maryland other parts of Maryland because of the way the, the geography, the two sides of the Potomac River and the Chesapeake Bay. And that meant that in the DC area, you couldn't really separate one state from another or one county from another. 
the both the enslaved people and the slave owners and other white people intermarried with other counties. They migrated back and forth and they sold and purchased uh, land. So there was a lot of connections. The African-American people were in communication because a lot of the families were separated, but they had their way of keeping in touch, kind of a grapevine, because not everybody was literate, although more people were literate than I think have been given credit. Maryland uh, was settled in the 1600s, as you know, that means that we have many generations of African Americans. And that means that many people, uh, just as an example, do not have the name, did not have the name of the person who owned them at the time of the Civil War. They had names that dated from way before that. And in some cases, they chose the names, in some cases, the names dated to someone they had been associated with much earlier. So that's one thing to remember, that Chesapeake history goes way back. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. The Underground Railroad, I just wanna mention something about the definition. And you noticed I was using the term enslaved. Uh, many people prefer that because it's a way of being respectful of the fact that slavery was a condition that was imposed upon the enslaved African Americans. It was not something that was part of their intrinsic nature. And that's something very important to emphasize. The Underground Railroad, as I define it, and as the Park Service defines it, is resistance to slavery through flight. That means it was not always organized. It was not always successful. But the people who ran away were showing courage, initiative, and ingenuity. And they often just got up and ran without any planned help or assistance of any sort. And uh, sometimes they'd been planning it for years and sometimes a moment arose and they took it. Uh, people often ask how many people escaped on the Underground Railroad. We don't know for sure, but even if it were 100,000 people, which some people would say is very high, you have to remember that at the time of the Civil War in eight. 1860, there were 4 million enslaved African Americans. So 100,000 compared to 4 million is a drop in the bucket. And that's probably an overestimate. But the slave owners were alarmed. They, people who were uh, escaping were setting an example for other people. They were giving them hope and they were communicating with that what they were uh the enslaved people were hearing from their owners and the people around them was not necessarily the truth about the rest of the united states uh as i said the underground railroad was not necessarily organized so i'm going to give you some examples of organization and some examples of spontaneous or uh, self-initiated emancipation. And I'm going to call the people who are escaping freedom seekers. And that's to emphasize the fact that they're taking initiative. They ha are taking agency and they're responsible for what they're doing. It was a big decision to escape and many people chose not to, not just because they were afraid, but because they would be leaving their families behind, their friends behind, and everything they'd ever known. And some people were not said, I'd rather be dead than be enslaved. And some of those are the people who escaped. Some of the other people may have felt that way, 
But if you were a woman with an elderly mother, if you were a woman with many small children, you didn't always have an option of running. So you had to use your courage to stay where you were. Uh, the people who helped with the Underground Railroad were black and white, free and enslaved. There were white networks, black networks, and biracial networks. And often the African Americans, the blacks, were unnamed. We'll never know who they were. In the slave narratives, which are the accounts that were published by some of the people who, freedom seekers who arrived in the North and were on the lecture circuit or were encouraged to publish their stories with or without the help of an editor, uh, often did not talk about the names of the African Americans who helped them. So we'll never know who some of those people were. Sometimes they say that they just went to a house and waited for a few minutes to see if they thought that they could trust the people in it, and they then went up to the door. Sometimes they had been told about a place to go, and sometimes they just took a chance and they were or were not lucky with their decision. So with that, I'm going to move on to uh, slide three. I don't know how many of you have ever seen a runaway ad before. I just wanted to give you an example so you could see the kind of information it includes, of course, it always has a reward at the top, but then in the small print, it usually says the reward is smaller if you're closer to home. The person um, who is advertising is usually the owner or the overseer, and it usually says where the estate that the person ran from was or where the person who lived, who was the owner, was. They usually give a description, a physical description. They give a description of the occupation. They give a description of what the person was wearing when they ran away. And they often say what they thought the person was going to do when they ran. On this one that you see here, it does not say that. But notice it says at the bottom, if he's secured in jail, then the reward will be paid. If you were running away, that was a crime under the Fugitive Slave Acts of 1793 and 1850. So automatically trying to find your freedom was a crime. You were considered to be stealing yourself. You were considered to be a piece of property and therefore you were stealing yourself as a piece of property. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. You saw the runaway ad, and I just want to say that there are many, many runaway ads advertised or in handbills that were given out. And that gives you an idea of how many tried to run away. There are hundreds for the Washington area. And that tells you that many of the people went on their own. They may or may not have had help. They may or may not have had a place they were going in mind. So that's the first point I wanted to make about the Underground Railroad. It's not always an organized thing. The second is I wanted to talk about the War of 1812. I don't know how many of you knew that the War of 1812, like the Revolutionary War, the British made proclamations offering freedom to any of the enslaved people who came over to their side if they would fight for the British. And there were many people who took their offer. And what I was going to mention in particular, all across Maryland, uh, along the Chesapeake, 
and the Potomac, there were many people who tried to escape to the British. And the British went up and down the Potomac to Alexandria. Alexandria was occupied. It surrendered without fighting. So that as the British ships were going up the Potomac, the people on the shore could see the ships going by. They knew about the proclamation. And so some of them were actually on the shore waving at the ships. Near Fort Washington, there are some examples of people who were definitely waving at the ships and they were told that the ship would be coming back for them. So the ships come back down the river from Alexandria. They moor off of Fort Washington, which at that point had been blown up because the Americans were not prepared for the British invasion. And they did not have preparations at the fort. The person who was running the fort gave, threw up his hands and said, I'll blow everything up and run. So that there was nothing left of the fort. The families around that were on their own and the people who were working for them or were owned by them saw their chance. Now, how do we know this? We know this because after the War of 1812, the treaty allowed for compensation of people whose enslaved bond, or whose bondsmen had run away to the British, if the owners could prove that. And the proof had to be in writing, sworn affidavits, and the National Archives has a number of those affidavits. And the affidavits give a lot of detail. They have to say where the owner and the person who was escaping lived, what their name was, what they looked like, what year they went. And so we have names, some of the names of the people would may or may not be familiar to the people who live in Prince George's County today. The names of the people in this case that I'm talking about, there were the Hattons, the uh, Edlins, and the Jenkins, who uh, were the owners of the people who tried to, who were successful in escaping. And we're lucky enough, not only do we know that they were successful in escaping, in the case of a number of them, we know where they ended up. They did not die in some of the camps for the people who had escaped, as some unfortunates did. Some of them made it to Nova Scotia and some of them made it to Bermuda. And we know the ones made it to Nova Scotia because not only was it written on the affidavit that was given to the British, there's something called the um, Book of Negroes that was a list of people who came from the United States during the War of 1812 to Britain and the, among the names on there are the names of the people from Fort Washington. So it's a very interesting moment that people don't remember because the War of 1812 was kind of like the second war of, revolution, of the revolution. Now I'm going to talk about somebody named John Dean. So I'm kind of skipping. Let's go to the next. This is his cemetery in the congressional, I mean, his, uh, his uh, stone in the congressional cemetery. He was a white lawyer from Brooklyn who came down to Washington looking for a government job because he ha had gone bankrupt. And while he, he was a Republican and when he got to Washington, he got to know some of the people who were supporting the people who were escaping from slavery during the Civil War. 
the people who have some, are called contrabands. And he became involved in defending some of them because, believe it or not, even though Washington in April 1862 had become emancipated, the people who belonged to people from Prince George's and Montgomery counties, if they were removed from Washington before the actual date of the emancipation, they were not freed. And if people who were living in Maryland counties that were um, got into Washington, they were not necessarily free. The Fugitive Slave Act was still in uh, effective through um, till very late in the Civil War. So you have the paradox that Maryland was a loyal state. Fugitive Slave Act was still in effect while up north it was long since uh, disregarded and the personal liberty laws made it uh, ineffective. So John Dean was responsible for defending some people who were from Prince George's County. There were some that belonged to the Duval family, Dennis Duval and his nephew, George Washington Duval and the Jackson brothers, and then um, Adam Hall. The Jackson brothers, unfortunately, were sent back into slavery, as often happened under the Fugitive Slave Act. But Adam Hall, uh, when it was being decided that he was going to be sent back, there was a tussle between John Dean and the lawyer who was working with him and the other side, and they did not allow Adam Hall to be taken away back to slavery. Instead, he was taken to the local jail. And once he got to the jail, the military authorities came and took him to a contraband camp. There were camps in Washington and in Alexandria and once he was there, he was no fool. He signed up immediately for the uh, first regiment of the US colored troops. Unfortunately, we know what happened to him later and it was he was killed in battle. But he was able to find his freedom before that. And you probably all know the story of the US colored troops, so I don't even need to get into that. And now I'm going to go into the history of the plumbers. Uh, so we go into the next slide. This is Emily Saunders Plummer. She was married to Adam Plummer. Adam Plummer was like the um, fixed point in his family's life. He stayed his whole life at Riversdale. Most of you have probably either driven by Riversdale or visited it. It is a magnificent um, mansion from before the Civil War. It's unfortunately they had to sell the land around it. So it's a small park with uh, suburban buildings all around it. But they tell the story of the Plummer family because of Adam Plummer. And he married someone who was not from Riversdale. She was from a nearby plantation. And what happened is she kept getting moved from one place to another, either by sale or by inheritance. And they ended up having a large number of children. And the ch children would, were separated from the parents often because they were owned by somebody different. And the family was exceptional for various reasons. I'm not going to go into the whole story because it's a long story. That's a whole chapter in the book I, I wrote. And there is a descendant who wrote a, well, the, uh, a book, an entire book on the family history. 
um, of different periods, including the um, Underground Railroad period. The family was literate. Adam Plummer learned to read from a traveling black minister. He taught other members of the family to read and write. And the family was fighting for its unity, for not being separated. And that's something that you don't always hear about, but in the Washington area, there are a number of examples of that, of, of families that were able to maintain ties and either stay together or be reunited after the Civil War. In the case of the Plumbers, one uh, brother of Emily ran away and unfortunately he had learned or fortunately he had learned to write but he wrote back from Canada. The family who owned the um, Plummer family discovered the letter and uh, they started selling people from the Plummer family as punishment. So that was an un unfortunate thing that happened. But then later, the two of the sons, uh, the elder sons of the Plummer family, escaped during the Civil War. One went into the Navy, one went into the, I believe, the Army or the Navy. Henry Vincent Plummer, uh, there's a whole story about him. After the war, he came back home. He was sent by the family down to New Orleans, where one of his sisters had been sold. But because she could read and write, she had sent letters back. They knew where she was. They waited until they had enough money, and it was safe to send somebody down to get her. And they brought her back. They didn't know she had been married, and she had a child. So she came back. Her husband had died with the child. Another thing that's exceptional about this family is that not only did the men in the family run away, but Emily herself, with her younger children, after the Emancipation Proclamation, after her two sons had run, felt that she was not going to stay enslaved any longer. So she gathered things together and arranged to go to Baltimore, which was about 15 miles from where she was in Ellicott City. And unfortunately, she trusted the wrong person. She gave him money, and he took all their possessions and the money she gave him, and he turned them over to the equivalent of the police. She was put in prison with the children. We have documentation of that because there is something from the jail records that says that the Blumbos, they got the name wrong and they got a lot of the first names of the children wrong, were in the jail. And what happened was she was a cook and all through her life of enslavement, being a cook had saved her from one problem and another. And being a cook in the jail meant that she cooked for the jailkeeper and his family. And he took a liking to her and when her owner could not afford to come and pay the expenses of her being in jail, the jailkeeper said, we're even, you cooked and took care of things while you were here. And word was sent back to Adam Plummer. Adam came with a wagon. He was allowed to do that by Benedict, um, Cal uh, Charles Benedict Calvert who was his owner, and the whole family that had escaped was taken back to Riversdale. They were in limbo for a year, but they were not turned back into slavery. They were working for the uh, Calvert family. And then when the war ended and the 13th Amendment was passed and the Constitution of Maryland was changed so that slavery was no longer illegal. They be all became free. They bought land and had paying jobs and had a house that was near Riversdale. <laughs>
I don't believe the house is still standing, but there's some pictures of it in uh, Nellie's book. Nellie being the daughter, uh, one of the youngest daughters of Emily, who was just a baby at the time that uh, the escape and so forth was going on. So that's an example of a family that used its own networks. Uh, there was a sister, I don't know if it was a sister of Emily or a sister of Adam who was living in Washington. And when the two sons escaped, we know that Henry Vincent Plummer went and stayed with his aunt in DC. Unfortunately, uh, we don't know her last name, so we can't try and track her down in D.C. But he was able to escape by going to stay with his father and then going to stay with his aunt. And so he used his own network. His brother probably used his help. And then, as far as we know, Emily used her own initiative to put together a plan and to find a way, hopefully, to get to Baltimore and from Baltimore, where there are a lot of free blacks, to blend in and then to move on further north when she could be joined by the rest of the family. So that's an example. We have the example of the people who went totally on their own, the example of the people who built their own networks, and then we have an example of an organized network. And the person I'm going to use for that is, uh, well, Charles Torrey is the sidekick of Thomas Smallwood. And I decided that rather than show you a picture of the book that Thomas Smallwood wrote, his autobiography, once you got to Canada, that you would rather see a human face. So, Thomas Smallwood met Reverend Charles Torrey when Reverend Charles Torrey moved to Washington. He was coming down to Washington to be a journalist and represent a newspaper from Albany. And he decided to stop along the way in outside of Baltimore for a um, slave owners conference. He wanted to see what was happening there. He was anti-slavery. He was outspoken and he was put in jail and he got to know uh, a slave family when he was in jail and he was so impressed by what was going on. He said, as soon as I get out of jail, I'm going to fight for the freedom of enslaved people. So when he got out of jail, Smallwood had heard about his story. He was very eager to meet him. It so happened that his wife was the laundress to the boarding house keeper where Tory was living. So they were introduced and they began to work together, helping people escape. They, it, this was the beginning of an organized biracial underground railroad in Washington, D.C. that had ties to uh, New York State, Philadelphia, New York City, and further north. And it was more the kind of underground railroad that one hears about uh, in the romantic versions where people are sent from one house to another and they're given a directions and a guide and have much more help. However, you have to remember that Washington was in the South. It was a slave city. So it was unusual that the help was starting before the people got to the Mason-Dixon line. And the help, uh, an example that we know of Someone heard about the fact that Smallwood and Tory were helping people escape. He went and to uh, Smallwood and Tory. He, well, actually, he went to Smallwood, who was working at the Navy Yard. He was taken to a butler of a house where the lawyer who owned it was absent. He was hidden in the attic with some other people who were waiting to get a guide north. 
and when there was a sufficient number of people, the guide took them through Maryland and Pennsylvania beyond Philadelphia, and then they moved on from there with another guide and were able to make it north to freedom. Uh, some parts, Pennsylvania was a free state, but you have to remember that if you were too close to the border and if you were in Philadelphia, there were slave catchers. They took not only, they took anybody they thought they would be able to sell in the southern market. That means that the person, if they were free but didn't have their papers or if they had their papers and they could get the papers away from them, they took them too and they were sold south. So that's the end of what I was going to say. I don't know if Misty has some questions for me. Uh, I do. I see one question from the chat. Um, the question is, have you encountered modern day descendants of the plumbers? There is a gentleman, uh, an elderly gentleman. I think he's, he's not well. I think he's still alive who lives uh, uh, in Prince George's County. He is the reverend at one of the churches. And I'm, there are sure to be other members of the family. I think it's, it's a large family. Uh, I have not met him though, but there was a whole movement to Henry Vincent Plummer got a dishonorable discharge from the army he was accused of being drunk and he was a temperance man. So that was very strange. And so in the last 25 years, there was a movement to get him an honorable discharge and members of the family and other interested members of the community came together and they were able to get him an honorable discharge. And that's how I know about this gentleman who was the minister in Prince George's County. Okay. Um, just one question from um, my reading of the book. Uh, there was a mention of um, uh, someone that helped uh, William Chaplin and uh, it made a few references to um, an escape he tried to organize, or he did organize, but it was unsuccessful, the uh, Pearl Escape. Um, can you talk a, bit, a little bit about that? I, I was totally unfamiliar with that, um, but I found it very interesting that that happened in Washington. So if you could uh, share some information about that. Okay, I'd be glad to. Um, there are two books on the Pearl Affair. I don't know if you have them in the library. One of them is by Josephine Pacheco and one of them is by Mary Kay Ricks. What happened was that Chaplin kept a very, very low profile. It wasn't until recently that uh, it was published that he had written a, a letter to one of the philanthropists who is an abolitionist in New York State saying that there was a group of people who wanted to run from Washington and could they get money to rent a sh small boat, a ship rather, to uh, take them from the Washington waterfront through the Chesapeake Bay up to Maryland where it comes to a point and then they would go through a canal and go into Delaware and then go into New Jersey or New York. And so money was sent. It was someone went up to Philadelphia and arranged to rent a boat with a captain. And they came down to Washington. It was supposed to be a secret. It was supposed to be just a few people who were going to escape together. But word got out. It turned out to be over 70 people. And they had bad luck in terms of the weather. The wind was not going in the right direction when they s snuck out of where they were on a Saturday night because they didn't work on Sunday. So they had a day to get a head start, but the wind was not going in their direction. So they didn't get a head start. By Monday morning, the word got out that they were gone. And 
one of the people who owned one of the people on the ship had a steamboat. And so he and a posse and uh, somebody representing the law got on the steamboat and went chugging after the Pearl, which was the name of the ship. And the Pearl had gotten caught in a storm and was in a, a little cove off of a point lookout and the steamboat almost passed by this little cove. Unfortunately, for some reason, they went in that direction. They saw the pearl and they towed it back to Washington. Everybody on board was put in jail, including the um, captains, the crew, one man crew and all the enslaved freedom seekers. Many of them were sold south, but there's a whole story about the Edmondson sisters and the Edmondson family, and there are Edmondson descendants still in Washington. Okay. Um, we do have a few more questions from the chat. Um, I'll ask Nick about the recording when we wrap up. Someone wants to know if this is recorded. But another question is, uh, what's the story about Anne Marie Weems? Okay, Anne Maria Weems, what, she was from another family that was fighting to stay together. And they were living in Rockville. But unfortunately, the, the father was free. He had an agreement with the owner of the rest of his family that he could pay off the cost of redeeming their freedom. The owner died. The heirs did not stand by the promise. And they was going, they was threatening to uh, auction off the family. And so the father arranged to go to New York. He'd never been out of Washington. This was a real adventure. He, of course, had to have his papers with him. He had to have introductions to people in New York. And he was able to raise a certain amount of money. And he came back. And he was also able to make contact with someone who was fostering one of his daughters who had escaped. And they raised money in Britain. And so they were able to purchase the mother and one of the sisters. But the younger sister was owned by a slave dealer who refused to sell her thinking he could get more money if he waited. And so finally, the people who had taken over from Tory and Smallwood uh, decided that the only alternative was for her to run. They had to wait until the right moment. They had to wait until there was somebody to help her because she was only about 14. They were not going to let her go by herself to uh, Pennsylvania. They had to wait until they found a doctor who was willing to transport her from Washington to Philadelphia. And then in Philadelphia, she was uh, introduced to somebody on the vigilance committee there, and she eventually got to Canada to an aunt and uncle. And it's a very interesting story, a very exciting story. She was dressed as the coachman for this doctor, and they met in front of the White House. It's not a place you think of as being associated with the Underground Railroad. Not at all. Uh, let's see, we do have another question. Um, let's see. Uh, someone asked, um, was the organized group the most common way for people to escape? Not necessarily. You look at the runaway ads, it's often for one person. If you look at the slave narratives, sometimes it was one, two, threes. Occasionally there were newspaper articles about quote unquote slave stampedes. It was harder to take an entire family if you had seven or eight children. Uh, that was very difficult. There were a few people in addition to Harriet Tubman who went back to the South to get family members or friends and bring them back north. 
I don't know if that answers the question. Okay. And one other question. Um, do you have plans to write a follow-up book? Well, I might write a book about Maryland and uh, other parts of Maryland besides the DC area, because there are many stories because Maryland is on the line with Pennsylvania and with Delaware and New Jersey about people who made it to freedom and what happened to them. And I thought that some of these people needed to be better known. A number of them were important in cases, legal cases, fighting the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act. Okay. Um, uh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, let me mention, for anybody who's interested, there's a very good website called Legacy of Slavery um, in Maryland by the Maryland State Archives that is an underground railroad website. There's also something called Documenting the American South that has a, over 100 slave narratives on it. And the National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom has a website and everything that has been nominated to the Network to Freedom and accepted has an abstract. And they're all across the country. And the stories, people went to Mexico, people went to Canada, they went to <clears throat> the Caribbean, England, California, Hawaii, you name it. Great. Um, as you were talking about how you developed the book, I didn't realize that you've written it in the um, in during the time you left the Park Service. So, um, and that's interesting that you uh, did did this work after um, you know leaving the Park Service. You had all of the information available and were able to um, combine it in book format. Um, so, so again, this was um, very, very uh, befitting to uh, what we want to do in the Sojourner Truth Room as far as collecting, collecting local history and connecting um, the public with stories um, of people and families in the history right in our community. So I appreciate you um, writing the book and taking the time to uh, talk with us about it this evening. Um, if, uh, if anyone is interested, um, Ms. Masur is going to share a list of those resources with me. Actually, I see where Nick uh, put them in the um, in the chat. So there's a link to all of the resources that she mentioned. But if if you don't, if you're not able to get those, she'll share them with me. And if you reach out to uh, me, um, I will get them for you as well. I'll send them to you via email. Um, so we are down to the last seven minutes. If um, if you have any more questions, we can take them now. I just want to say it was an honor for me to be able to speak. I think this is my biggest crowd so far. And the book is available through Amazon and various independent bookstores in the area. Yes, and we have a copy. Uh, we have a few copies. We have a copy available in the truth room. And I think there's also another copy available circulating throughout the, uh, the library system. So um, it is available through the library if you're interested as well. All right, and, um, and I don't see any more questions. So we're gonna wrap up here again. Thank you um, for this opportunity. It took us a while to get here. We talked back and forth uh, back in November and we scheduled for March uh, so that you could talk about Emily Plummer during uh, Women's History Month. And then with the closing of the library, we were canceled. So I'm glad we were able to uh, come together and do this virtually. And as you mentioned, this is a large crowd. Um, we rarely get this many people to attend in Brent. So I'm, I'm glad that this um, uh, worked out well for us. And a lot of people got to know information about the book and the history of um, Prince George's County. So um, again, I'll say thank you all for uh, joining us um, this evening and um, please stay tuned to more uh, programs coming from the Sojourner Truth Room and uh, the library system as well. Thank you. Thanks so much everyone for joining us. This is Nick in the background. Just wanted to uh, give our appreciation to both Misty and Jenny.
from the communication outreach team at the library. We appreciate uh, their making this happen. This is a really important talk um, for the library to, to convene and make available to all of you. Um, and along these lines, uh, we're continuing our programming around anti-racism and the history of oppression against black people in America. Um, we have a really special announcement that just went out today. Uh, Dr. Ibram Kendi, author of How to Be an Anti-Racist, will be joining us on Monday, July 20th at 7 p.m. for a live virtual discussion. Um, I'll put the registration link in the chat in just a moment. And if you'd like to participate in a discussion event in advance of his appearance, uh, we're gathering back here on Crowdcast next Tuesday, June 30th at 7 p.m. Uh, for a discussion that our COO for uh, Public Services, Michelle Hamuel, will be leading. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you.